Always a good time when Ben Greenfield comes and visits us. I always don't know what he's going to say, though. You never know. Yeah. I, I actually really in, enjoyed this conversation. This uh, I loved. I was I couldn't wait to talk to him since he announced that he would be unschooling his kids, and I didn't even know what unschooling meant mm. until him. I didn't know this was an option where uh, parents can take kids through a a non curriculum. Uh, format of taking their kid through school. I thought that was... Yeah, he explained it pretty well. Yeah, no, extremely yeah. fascinating. And uh, I couldn't even picture what that would look like until we discussed this with him. And so I really enjoyed that part of the mm -hmm. conversation. He's one of the smartest people in the fitness space. He's a little weird. He's a little out there. Very, very smart dude. A lot of integrity. Good friend of ours. Um, so every time we have it, this is probably what our four or maybe our fifth interview with Ben, I think. Yeah. We always have a good time with the guy. He's a, he's a great guy. So we think we're going to love this episode. You can find him on Instagram at Ben Greenfield Fitness. Um, his website is bengreenfieldfitness.com. He has a podcast called the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. He's actually, he put us on his podcast years ago when we first got started and actually gave us our first big boost. So we'll always be uh, grateful for that one. Um, so a lot of you guys listening to our podcast, I know you heard us through the Ben Greenfield pod podcast. Um, and Ben now has a supplement company. He sells coffee through and other types of supplements. And because of that, uh, we got you guys a discount. Uh, so if you're a Mind Pump listener here's and you like his supplements, here's your discount code. You can go to getkeon.com. Keon is spelled K-I-O-N forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump. You'll get, excuse me, use the code Mind Pump 10 and you'll get 10% off uh, your whole purchase. Before the episode starts, uh, I want to let everybody know that MAPS Anabolic, our most popular workout program, is 50% off. It's a phenomenal program for strength building, body sculpting, and metabolism boosting. Here's how you get the 50% off discount. Go to mapsred.com and use the code RED50, R-E-D-5-0, no space, for the discount. So I want a, I want a nanny. and Or a manny. Whatever, whatever right? A manny. Yeah. I just want I want another human in the house that's just kind of helping support. Uh, it's so nice. I, and yeah. we've had like, so my sister right now, she comes down and she spends a whole week with us. And it's amazing because she comes right behind us. Like she walks the dogs if I need her to. She does the dishes. She kind of prepares meals for us. She'll take the baby for a little bit if Katrina needs a nap. And it's just the relief that, you know, each of us need. And then it also takes the pressure off of me if I've had a crazy long day and I know she's had a long day and, I, and I'm not there. I don't want to relieve her. She doesn't. She just needs some relief. So I've been trying to push it, but... She's kind of stubborn right now. She really is. I want to try and figure this out. She's got that going on right now where she feels like she wants to try and figure it out for herself before she decides. Like almost like she's giving up. And I'm like, you're not giving up. Yeah. It's not like you're like, I, I know you can do it, but it's like, why not? If we're in a, a position where we can do something like that, why not? You know, I think the the ideal feeling that, that a woman should have in the home is that she's just the freaking queen, right. like the matriarch. And if she, if she, and, and ideally she doesn't have to lift a finger. To, to do the dishes and to clean up after the boys or to do the laundry. I mean, I realize that, you know, some people might be sitting there thinking, dude, what a bunch of rich efforts talking about, you know, the, you know, the woman of the household just sitting around in a bathtub drinking yeah. wine. Hey, it's all about what you spend your money on. You're not a guy that's rolling around in a $150,000 whip. You're not out, you know, making it rain at places like that. You'd rather invest money in things like that. I think there's right. nothing wrong with that. I want somebody to walk down the driveway a quarter mile and get the packages and come back up while I'm downstairs podcasting. That's, <laughs> yeah. not, that's not too much to ask. <laughs> and, I, and I don't want my wife to have to work so hard that she's stressed out at the end of the day. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, you guys have a lot of... Just don't be, hire Fabio. I don't, don't want to be married to an alcoholic. Yeah. yeah well, you guys, I mean, you also, you're, you're home takes a lot of things to takes a lot of effort to take care of you have a lot of animals and there's a lot of things yeah yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of like fitness equipment that's got to be <laughs> up kept and little hydrogen water generating machines that have to be cleaned out that all come with their little instructions and every time a new toy comes it's like the ikea for fitness somebody's got to put all that shit together and i kind of like doing some of that stuff myself mm. but it's not my best purpose <clears> to be <throat> dinking around with a screwdriver on some infrared light panel are you guys still foraging around your property and getting plants and stuff to cook with and yes all that? yeah yes i i, I found an, an amazing recipe 
because uh, because I like to make pesto. I'm on a pesto kick. Yeah. Sal would probably dig oh, that yeah, pesto. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Like a ribeye steak, like slathered with pesto. Pesto mm. goes good on everything. Oh my gosh, it's so good. And uh, the the thing is, like a lot of these wild plants, you can make a really nice pesto out of. Like like uh, you know dandelion, which is wonderful for for the liver and nettle. All the deer on our property feed on nettle, and it, and it grows these deer into huge white tails because it's so high in amino acids and fatty acids. So we've got this stinging nettle and uh, we have wild mint. So, so you get some of that minty flavor. And then, you know, we grow little, little herbs in our garden, like rosemary and thyme. Uh, another one that I harvest is plantain, which actually grows near the nettle, which is kind of cool because a lot of times things that hurt you in nature have something that grow nearby them to, to fix that hurt. So I've heard case, of this, and th- this is true. It's not a myth that no, this actually happens. No, like in the case of stinging nettle, right, it's because your hands kind of get stung by the backside of the nettle because there's little thorns on it, but you rub some of that plantain leaf on your hand and it just goes away. But the plantain is also very soothing to the stomach. So I put a little bit of that in there too. So I'll, so I'll come back home with this big bag of all these wild greens just from around our property. And uh, then what I, what I was doing was I put them in the food processor and then, of course, use your pine nuts or, or walnuts work very well. Just a shit ton of olive oil, like a really good, spicy, dark, you know, rich mm-hmm. olive oil, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And then you, you just hit blend on the food processor. It's crazy easy. You know, 90 seconds, you have pesto. Uh, and normally you'd add Parmesan cheese to that as well. And even though Parmesan cheese doesn't have the the lactose sugars in it, mm-hmm. I still don't do that well with dairy. But the Parmesan cheese is what gives it that nice umami, mm-hmm. you know, uh, kind of salty flavor. And so it's lacking something, pesto without the Parmesan. So what I figured out is that you can actually ferment the nettle. So if you have like some old pickles and, you know, like, a, like an old pickle jar in your fridge, you save that brine. And you go and, and harvest all your plants and everything, and you just shove them into a glass mason jar, and then you dump the brine over that. You put a lid on it, and uh, then then you just set it on the kitchen counter for about two weeks, and it actually ferments, and it gives you this same nice, rich umami flavor <laughs> as if you had a Parmesan cheese. Then you put that in the food processor with your nuts and your olive oil and everything, and dude, it's next level shit. Now, are you in, are you incorporating a lot of this in like uh, the way you're teaching your boys? Because I I know now that you are you've pulled the boys completely out of school. You're 100 percent homeschooling them right now. Are you incorporating yeah. stuff like this? Uh. No, mostly they uh, they're responsible for killing animals. They they kill and fill dress animals. They just wander around with little knives. They're like uh, Captain Fantastic. I get that comment a lot. People are like, "Oh, you guys live out in the on the sticks like Captain Fantastic." <laughs> <laughs> My kids are covered in mud with daggers in their teeth. Yeah, you know, jumping out, <laughs> slitting the it's necks. Like Lord of the flies out there. Huh? Yeah, no, they they do a lot of this stuff with me for two reasons. Number one, it's it's a very good way for them to to go out and learn and immerse themselves in nature. And of course. You know, as you guys know, there's tons of benefits of that for kids from their <clears throat> biome to free play to nature immersion. But uh, they also, of course, have a podcast themselves. They have a food podcast. Right? I don't so know this. Oh, no any, way. Anytime. Yeah, they've had it for a year and a half. Anytime I'm, I'm prepping food, you know, I'm including them. And then they have like they have chefs visiting the house now and taking them through these complex Italian multi-course meals. They go out to, to different restaurants in town and do reviews. They have all these different recipes that they create. They do uh, two podcasts a month. They have a VA. They pay $400 a month to as their brand manager. So she takes care of all their social media accounts, the, wow. the editing, the publishing. And then they they so go great. find the recipes they want to create or the chefs they want to interview. And uh, they started as an audio podcast. Now it's a video podcast. They've got five sponsors like Wild Planet Sardines and Butcher Box and a lot of these kind of food sponsors. <laughs> how have, much of they, this did you orchestrate they, and how much of this have, have they done on they, their own? They have their Amazon affiliate account linked to their bank account. <laughs> I mean, that like they're, every two seconds they're just dropping. Yeah. Yeah. Love yeah. it. And plus Washington state and, and most states require that any children who are homeschooled or unschooled take a core curriculum in Washington state. There's 12 subjects, you know, math, history, mm-hmm. reading, writing. One of those subjects is occupational studies, right? So anytime they're doing the podcast, we can, they keep a diary every day of what they've done so that should we ever be audited about their curriculum, we can turn around and say, yo, they were, they were, they were cooking, right? That's <coughs> chemistry. That's science. Uh, they have been building a tree fort for the past three months. I hired a contractor to come up and work with them on this tree fort design they drew up. And that's their math curriculum for, for the summer, just mm-hmm. building this massive 
tree for it. Mm. Uh, and then they're, of course, doing their podcast. That's that's a science and chemistry of food, but then it's also occupational studies. It's it's math as they're doing their banking and learning about how the affiliate sponsorships work. And so now, now what are what are your theories on on doing it this way versus a traditional way? Let your kid go through school. Like, what are your theories and uh, what do you see already happening, and what do you expect to happen by by schooling them this way? Well, in the book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, uh, uh, Yuval, uh, was it Yuval Nohan Harari? Probably just butchered his name. You guys know the cat I'm talking about? Mm. I don't. Yeah, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a good book, but I, the, the author's name is difficult to pronounce or remember. He dictates that the, the employee or the worker of the future is not going to be the factory worker that the post-industrial era and the agricultural revolution kind of centered education around, right? We want people to be able to work in factories. We want people to be able to put square pegs and square holes. Uh, we want people to be able to think inside the box and follow the rules. Uh, yes, uh, Doug just pulled it up. You've all Noah Harari. Okay. You've all Noah Harari. And instead, we need free thinking, uh, resilient, creative workers who are able to adapt to new jobs on the fly as things like artificial intelligence and automation replace certain positions. And because of that, if a child is learning in a classroom situation at the same pace as everyone else, taking the subjects that you know the, the states or the government has dictated is going to be the exact subjects that they should choose, whether or not they're passionate about those subjects, if they're not allowed to engage in a great deal of creativity and free play, similar to the way that the, the Finland school system is built, with plenty of time outdoors, with plenty of time uh, in unpredictable situations, then they're likely not going to be positioned to adapt to this this rapidly changing work structure that we're now immersed and in. And it's changing where, faster and faster. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, 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 truck, truckers are a perfect example, right? And they're, they're, we're going through that right now with with artificial intelligence and automation potentially disrupting the the trucking industry. Right. And in an ideal situation, uh, the, the, the people who are most positioned to not be affected by that are the people who can go out and do something even more creative. A, a better example might be a surgeon who is likely going to be replaced by a robot in the next decade. Right. Robotic surgery can be far more precise and less erroneous than than a human physician doing surgery. And a human physician who has been educated to think outside the box and move on and be creative might go on to find the cure for cancer or might go on to develop an even better robotic surgery tool. All right. So, so the idea is that by unschooling, which is essentially self-directed education, it involves identifying what a child is passionate about what it is that really turns them on. And that's going to change from year to year and even from month to month. And then surrounding them with as many toys, books, items, technologies, tools, people, etc., that allow them to pursue that passion and take a deep dive into that passion. And then you just step back and let entropy emerge, right? Let, let the children do what they want. And your only job is to surround them with what they need to get that done. So tell, right. tell me how this has unfolded for you then. Like, did you, when you first decided to unschool them, did you go right into it with a curriculum idea or did you like let them almost guide and no. direct where you were going to go? Like, how did that look? No curriculum. We started off with about two weeks of, of almost like a storyboarding where they had these giant posters and they were writing down all the things they're interested, all the places they want to visit, all the cultures they want to explore, the cuisines that they want to learn to cook, uh, the the um, the the subjects like, you know, American history, for example, you know, is one subject that they're just very interested in. And then I go out and uh, I, I go to Amazon and I buy all the books and all the Lego toys and all the kits. And, you know, so a few examples would be they were interested in drones, right? So I got them access to a drone course online. I bought them a drone to build. I bought them all the accessories for the drone and the drone just went down into the closet. And, you know, once they finished fifth grade, you know, and, and we're just done with school, 
they started to delve into the closet and go and pull out all these different items and just begin on, on their own volition to, to play with and to build these, you know, and I came home one day and they'd, they'd built a drone and another day they'd programmed a Lego robot. Uh, like I mentioned, they've, they've built an entire tree fort over the summer, you know, just with, with wood. And, you know, I have a guy coming over a couple times a week to teach him some things and they have a tree fort now. Uh, but, but the idea is there is no structured curriculum, right? It's simply get the things that they need to be able to delve into their passions and step back and let them play with it. Now, what are the biggest challenges mm -hmm. with the strategy? Cause I can imagine parents right now are like, my kid just wants to play video games and watch TV all day, or my kid doesn't yeah. know what they like or whatever. Like what is, what are some of the challenges you've encountered with this? Well, I think we've talked about this before on previous podcasts, that there's no rules in the Greenfield household, right? There's no, like, you can't have gluten. There's no screen time rules. There, there's no, you know, this is a good snack. This is the bad snack rules. You can't have that. Like, there are no forbidden fruits in our home. Instead, we educate them about the consequences of a decision, such as, you know, neural inflammation or gut inflammation from gluten consumption or the effects on their sleep cycles from, you know, watching TV late into the night. And then we, we let them sit with the consequences of any decision that they might make, like stomach upset or, or you know, not being able to, to get through the day because of poor sleep, et cetera. But I think the biggest thing when it comes to, you know, is my child going to sit around and play video games all day? Are they going to be tied to their, their screen all day? Is that the adults that they're surrounded with must provide the example, right? Like in our house, if there's downtime, <clears throat> dad is reading or playing the guitar, right? Mm -hmm. That TV is rarely on. It's just not a thing. It's not the norm in our house for if there's downtime to go and turn on the TV. There aren't any video games in our house. It's just not something we do. We don't, we don't play video games. And, and they downloaded like a chess program to their computer, but it's more fun for them to sit with dad for 45 minutes before dinner and play chess across the table, you know, while we're joking and listening to music. And so a big thing is that if you structure your house and the parents are a living, breathing example of the way that things like video games and food and snacks and however else you spend your downtime should be treated, then generally the kids will, will, will will move towards that you know even with supplementation right like I've, I've had the kids genomes sequenced and and have identified you know like they they're uh, they don't have the gene that can assist them with uh making vitamin d from sunlight they only have 50 percent of the glutathione genes um they have, they have lower levels of, of bdnf and and you know a variety of factors that dictate that they could engage in better living through science and supplement so i've bought all those supplements they're all in the fridge I don't tell my kids, go take your supplements. But when I go to the fridge and I take whatever glutathione, I'll be like, I'm going to take my glutathione <laughs> now. <laughs> this is, mm, mm, that's damn good glutathione. <laughs> mm, hey guys, this is good glutathione. <laughs> All right. And then a lot of times, you know, they'll rush down and, and they'll, they'll grab their supplements because they remember because dad's taking his. And so it's, it's all about being an example and also making sure that the living environment is equipped with things that allow them to engage in, in productivity and support that versus the house just being littered with screens and video games. Now, what, uh, have you encountered any challenges that you could tell us? Have there been any situations where you've had some sticking points and kind of had to figure out your way around them or help you know navigate them? You know, it's been really smooth. It's been really smooth so far. I, I think the only thing it seems like you've that, you've been setting the table for many years for yeah. this to be smooth. Like I would imagine, if you try to make this transition and you were a household where mom and dad stared at the TV for four hours a night, like that would be a challenge. But because you've kind of already set the table for this way of living, it seems kind of already natural, right? Right. the on, The only thing I've run into is that let's say they do want to be a physician or an astronaut and go to college. Well, they they need to know how to take a standardized test. They need to take a yearly standardized test through the state of Washington. Oh, so they're required to and take they'll, that. They'll need to take their college entrance exams. Mm. And so just that idea of going from unschooling to actually needing to whip out a book and sit at the kitchen table to prepare for a standardized test, uh, that's that I think is going to be the hardest thing. We've still got four more months till we'll, we'll start digging into you know how we'll tackle that piece. But that's really the thing I'm most apprehensive about is, you know, going from just pure creative free play in a child's dream situation to being required learning. to test yeah, you know take a exactly. test by the government how are you going to discuss that exactly. with exactly come on inside put down your bows and arrows you guys got to learn pre-calc now at the kitchen table 
And the only reason why is because you have to take a test. Yeah. Right. Like and that's, why yeah, dad? that's rough. Yeah. Why yeah. dad? Why am I being yeah. forced? Yeah. Right. <laughs> You're punishing think, me. Well, honestly, what, what I tell them is you guys might, think differently when you're 17 or 18, you might want to go to college. You don't want to go to college now, but if that changes, the last thing is I want, I want is for my kids to think, dude, dad totally screwed me over right. <laughs> and I'm effed up now because I can't go to university because I, I had no idea when I was 12 that I need to be taking these tests and dad didn't tell me and dad didn't encourage me to. So now I can't go to college. You know, I, I don't want that scenario. No, that's so, smart. You're thinking about that yeah. already. What about um, uh, socializing the kids? Like, what do you do right now for mm. them to interact with other kids? Yeah, that's a common question in, in homeschooling and unschooling. And it's, it's a complete moot point because they're in jujitsu. Uh, they're in, they're in the, I mean, think about summer camp. Right. When, when you got to summer and you had like you could go to theater camp and you could go to horseback riding camp and you could go to to, uh, you know, like some nature camp, wilderness survival, basketball camp, soccer camp, whatever. It's like that. But all year long, like they're they're in so many camps and classes and clinics and off with other kids, they're constantly the interacting with other kids. Yeah, exactly. So it is. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that they're not competing against or with or in the same room as or socializing with other kids. So, Do they find time away from each other? Like, do, is there like, when they do hang out with other kids, do they separate or do they stay close together? They stay very close together. They're mm -hmm. very close. And I think that's going to be kind of difficult for them yeah. when they need to cut ties with one another because they're very close. As a matter of fact, one of my biggest fears, and this is a nightmare I've had a few times, is that one of them dies. Mm -hmm. right? oh my God. That one of them dies because yeah. they're, they're just like, they're joined at the hip. And, and I will, you know, when, when they're 13 and that's only two years away and they'll go through a rite of passage, you know, they've been training with the wilderness survival instructor for years now, like the same camp for four years in a row, you know, going and learning their, their bow drill and wilderness tracking and fire making and learning how to survive primitive weaponry, everything like that. So that they're resilient enough to be able to survive in the wilderness. Right. And so when they're 13, they'll have a week, you know, with a wool blanket and a backpack and a knife out in the wilderness, but each on their own, right? Not together. And then they'll come out of that and then we'll have their, their coming of age ceremony. They'll go through their first foray into plant medicine. They'll journey, they'll dissolve their ego. Then they'll pass into manhood and we'll have like an official kind of cutting of the cord ceremony where they're responsible to help pitch in for food for the Greenfield household, you know, help, help to, to, to support themselves, use more of the money yeah. that they're making from this podcast to buy their own things, but they'll, they'll be identified as men at that point, that crossing of the threshold, but that will be done with them alone, not together. Oh, so, that's going to be tough. Yeah, that's yeah. Really tough one. That's going to be a tough one. You yeah. said dissolve their ego. How? Plant medicine. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how does that, yeah. how does that work with a 13 year old? Yeah. Uh, it, there, there are people doing it mm -hmm. and, uh, there are many cultures that do this as well, but, uh, it is, it's not dissimilar to what you'd experience as an adult, right? Ego disillusion, uh, the ability to be able to, to see yourself in a different light, um, to embrace greatness or to embrace perhaps something different about yourself than you would have perceived had your ego been on full alert. And, you know, typically those are with things like psilocybin or, or ayahuasca or other Amazonian plant medicines. And I, um, I've already identified a very responsible you know, facilitator who will will oversee that whole thing. Interesting. Now, this is something that's relatively new to you even, right? Because I think when we mm -hmm. first met you, you didn't, you hadn't done any plant medicine. You hadn't gone into that. And that was, so what, three years ago? No, when you met me, I, I had. You had, uh, okay. I, he just I, lied I had, to you. I had journeyed with- uh, <laughs> You weren't on that level yet. Yeah, I journeyed with psilocybin and with, okay. with ayahuasca and with 5 meo <laughs> Hmm. And uh, now that's something that I'm doing on a quarterly basis. Uh, and, and my wife has joined me with that as well as a sort of uh, like couple's journey. And I, I think that as, you know, Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel outline in Stealing Fire, it certainly is, you know, something relatively hedonistic. We know that, you know, depletes 5-HTP and, you know, you get some, some pretty significant serotonin imbalances and there's just some, some neurochemical reasons not to do something like that frequently. In addition to the idea that it can become an escape, many people don't integrate afterwards. Many people don't journal afterwards. Many people don't. This is what I take, see a lot of. Yeah, they, I see that's more common right now is that it's, especially in our space, I've, I, it, the 20 years that I've been in fitness, I've never seen so many people in the fitness space talk about uh, ayahuasca, DMT, psilocybin, LSD, all this stuff is coming, is surfacing like no other. 
and I, I feel like very few people are like you. And I always get asked about you every time you come into town, like, what is he been fucking weird? That guy's crazy. This night. Honestly, if there was anybody that I would want to talk to about all these fringe ideas and things, it's you because I feel like you you have learned to discipline yourself really well. I can't say that about a lot of other people that are talking about the same things that you're talking about right now because when I see what they're doing, I go, it looks like just a big party to me. It, it is in many cases. It's because, it, let's face it, it is kind of fun to lay back and just let your mind wander and forget life and you know, and, and go to a happy place full of, you know, sparkles and rainbows and kaleidoscope imagery. And and you wake up and you're like, I found myself. I saw God. Yeah. And then a week later, you're just back at the grind, Mm. stressed out, you know, existential angst and lost because you don't have an intention going in and, or you don't actually have some type of integration practice planned coming out. I mean, my wife and I have, we, we have those, those back jack chairs in our bedroom now, and we sit facing each other, gazing into each other's eyes for 15 minutes every night. I mean, you know, 9.15, the kids are in bed. By 9.30, we're sitting in bed, legs intertwined, facing each other, just in silence, integrating. Wow. No, it's, talking. Oh, oh talking. You know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, and is this a practice that came from one of your yes, journeys? Okay. Yes. And we've journeyed like that too. Oh, wow. and completely, you know, complete no judgment zone. When you journey, you're, you're sitting there for four or five hours facing yeah. each other. Right. And it, 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 which is a crazy, crazy experience to be with your partner, your lover, both of you egos fully dissolved, staring each other's, staring into each other's eyes, you know, seeing each other as, as spirits. Gazing is a lost art, man. Yeah. What, 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 is, what are some of the things that you notice about that? I've experienced this myself too. So, but I want to hear you talk about it. Um, you know, what, what is it about that with your partner? And we are seeing that this, this is uh, what I think was it Colorado that already w- legal right now. With, uh, uh, decriminalized. Uh, if, and I'm not sure where it was. It might've been Colorado decriminalized. And it's, and it's yeah, probably going to be a, a, a you in know. Oakland too. Wasn't it? Johns Hopkins just launched their new research arm, which uh, uh, Tim Ferriss kind of popularized that entire press release and was one of the benefactors for that entire arm. Uh, I had dinner last night with Dr. Uh, Victoria Hale, who is work with MAPS Foundation and is responsible for for a lot of the additional research into into ayahuasca and also psilocybin. Uh, in Canada, uh, they're going to be rolling out a series of different medical clinics designed for therapeutic administration of these. There are folks like Dr. Dan Engel, who has a clinic in Boulder and will be opening up another clinic in Austin with the use of plant medicines for concussion, for TBI, uh, for, for trauma-based therapy. You know, there are... There are people, although it's it's not legal currently, but there are still uh, many facilitators overseeing things like high dose MDMA sessions, you know, w- within the U.S. for mm-hmm. therapy. And this is this is something that people are becoming increasingly aware of the benefits of these type of medicines when used in a therapeutic, responsible manner. I'm glad you said that because I see a lot of frivolous use, uh, and these are powerful, powerful substances. Just as they can benefit you, they can also cause a lot of problems. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, fucking take 300 milligrams of like uh, Iboga, South African bush extract before a workout, and you're like one of those African warriors, you know, when you're at the gym, and you microdose with a little psilocybin and, and niacin and lion's mane before a hard cognitive day of work. And I mean, like, it's that's one of the best nootropic stacks ever. And, and so in small amounts, these things can be amazing just for general productivity and making life better. I think it's, it's, you know, when, when you get to the larger amounts, you know, that we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll see psilocybin rinsed, washed and repeated in the same way that CBD and THC were right? Mm-hmm, recreational mm-hmm. use, you know, people flying off the wheels, you know, going on crazy trips. I, I think it's, it's going to be a little bit weird and kind of wild, wild westy over the next five to 10 years. I agree. Uh, and mark my words, there's going to be some people making serious money. There's going to be some pharmaceutical companies oh, huge. making some serious money off of these compounds, including, the- including replications of like ayahuasca and DMT and psilocybin like synthetic versions of mm-hmm. them yeah i think yeah. the psychiatric applications are going to be in my opinion i think we're going to see breakthroughs in, in psychiatry that uh, that we we can't even comprehend uh, curing mental disorders and, and ailments that were before uncurable and just treatable with numbing agents it, it's my per- personal belief but i also see the potential negatives of people abusing these things one thing that seems to go hand in hand and maybe this is just what i see in social media it seems like people, the, the, the use of these substances goes hand in hand with the uh, adoption of an open relationship lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's any connection or do you think that's just part of the whole frivolous like, oh, we're partying and this is just kind of part of it? I, I think that a big part of that is the disinhibition that some of this stuff can create. 
I mean, you know, very, very simple example, but my, my wife and I use ketamine and oxytocin for sex and it's amazing. I mm -hmm. mean, like, like intranasal ketamine and oxytocin, that makes for a, a fantastic date night. Um, <laughs> and, and it, it removes a lot of inhibitions and you have a, a, a crazy good time. And it's a lot of fun. Um, guys sometimes get a little droopy dick from the ketamine, but that's nothing a little, you know, microdose of, of sildenafil or whatever else can't, can't fix. But then you, you put other people into a scenario like that, you know, and you've got almost like a burning man esque scenario, mm -hmm. right. Where there's like orgies and couples surfing and, you know, and, uh, I, I think that part of it is the, the disinhibition that occurs. I think part of it is just the, the, kind of like the the free love type of personality you know the, the 60s hippies type of mentality that's still the type of person that's largely associated with with a lot of these plant medicines like the person who's just willing to do that tends to be a little bit more uh, oh i see what free, you're saying free spirited and independent a little and bit of a self-selection bias box. yeah yeah and we and we talked about this when we podcasted in uh austin from paleo fx uh, i think about a year and a half ago and uh, I'm, I'm sure we can we can link to this in the show notes. But we talked a lot about how, I mean, that stuff is is just so fucking attractive and fun and tempting. But you know, you have to choose whether your goal is short term pleasure or long term legacy. Right? There's very few societies that I know of that have been built successfully upon a polygamous open relationship type of culture because. You know, uh, uh, monogamy, um, you know, contractual relationships, if you want to call them that, long term relationships with children and a stable nuclear family home seem to allow for some amount of societal stability that can't be replicated when a village is raising a child or when, you know, there, there is no, no clear man or clear woman as, as, a, as a head or a leader of a household. And so I feel like I just couldn't build a greenfield legacy. I couldn't have my children feel stable. Uh, and I, I couldn't just manage the household logistically if I had multiple partners or open relationships. I just feel like long term, it'd be un, it, it wouldn't allow for, for me to be able to affect the impact and the change that I want the greenfield family to go on. Yeah, I feel like produce. it's a, I feel like it's a, it's a base way to act. And as you elevate, you start to figure out what really works. And uh, committing to one person, I think, is a more evolved way. It requires more growth and development. It really does. No, no different than committing to a life of, you know, surrounded by cupcakes and, and, and candy and saying, I'm going to eat the stuff that's healthy for me and good for me. Um, what about the, the mind uh, molding effects in the sense of, do you think that these substances can be used to brainwash people or to change them? There's a lot of conspiracies around you know, the CAA, you know, experimenting with these substances to control people's minds or, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Manson, how he used LSD to turn a bunch of suburban yeah. kids into murderers. Do you think there's some, some, some things we need to fear in that sense? I have no idea, but <laughs> they say the same thing about fluoride, right? And, yeah, and, cal and calcification of the pineal gland. And once you, yeah. but that would be the opposite, right? Because if you calcify the pineal gland and are no longer producing DMT, what they're saying is that you are more, uh, what was the word you used? Uh, uh, moldable. Yeah, or, you're, yeah. You're more manipulable. Sure. People Manipulatable. Can manipulate you. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not quite sure what would affect the neurochemistry and manipulation more, less mm -hmm. DMT or more DMT, but that is one conspiracy theory, right? That's why we have fluoride in the water is so right. that we're, that we're good little factory workers and lemmings. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but, but the one last, last thing that comes to mind for me with this whole open relationship and, and plant medicine type of thing is that I think it can be used in the opposite manner too. And this is what I've experienced. My wife and I, you know, for 14 years, we're very emotionally and sexually connected, but not spiritually connected, mm. not intertwined as spirits and souls, not looking into each other's eyes as unique sparks meant to be for each other from the beginning of the universe, you know, as, as these two angelic beings who have this very special spiritual relationship. And now that we've connected spiritually, on that deep, deep level. I mean, we can feel each other from afar. We know when we're dreaming about each other. We know when we're thinking about each other. Like it's, it's freaky. And, and I'm sure that comes down to kind of like a quantum physics, you know, proton particle type of thing where, 
you know, and, and I'm, I'm a believer that, that, you know, there, there is this fourth dimension that we've had yet to fully uncover and that we actually, you know, are, are pretty deep when it comes to being spirits and souls. And really that's the most special part of us that nobody can take away. But then when you connect with your lover on that level and you see them as this incredibly unique spirit, uh, it, it's, it's cool for two reasons. Number one, you're just so fucking connected. Yeah. You look into your lover's eyes and you see them as, 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 as literally like, you know, something like, like a goddess or an angel. And then, you know, the, the other part of it is that, uh, you, you, you just, you treat everybody differently. I, I feel like, like it, like that love and relationship, that you experience with one person, you begin to see everybody as a spirit or a soul or a very unique being. So it kind of changes the way that you judge people or the way that you treat other people. Too. Now, how do you wrap, uh, you know, using plant medicines and going on these journeys and with that rigid sort of structure of your spiritual beliefs and how does that all intertwine and sort of help either to explain uh, you know, a deeper meaning that you're getting from, you know, let's say the Bible as you're a Christian uh, or how to kind of explain, uh, you know, how that can enhance the experience even more. You know, I, I think that everything was put on the planet, you know, for me as a creationist, as, as, as a believer that, that a higher power created everything around us, I think everything was put there for a purpose from wine and weed to ayahuasca and psilocybin and the hundreds of plant medicines we have yet to even discover, you know, in South America or the Amazon, for example. And I think that because of that, anything can be used for good or for evil, right? We, I mean, something as simple as wheat, right? You can go out into a wheat field and pick wheat and just chew it right there off of the, off of the, off of the, you know, with the, with the chaff and the bran and the kernel and everything else and all that concentrated gluten and fuck up your gut. And you can, you can grab a wonderful, lovely, you know, biodynamic wine and drink to excess and, and develop liver psoriasis, right? And you can smoke yourself into oblivion. Or you can have a glass of wine at the end of the day or at a wedding and, you know, go, go dancing and just feel that, that slight release of, of GABA, that inhibitory neurotransmitter and feel wonderful. And you can, you know, use it, use a little bit of weed to relax at the end of the day or a little bit of CBD to enhance your sleep. You can use a, a little bit of psilocybin to, to increase your cognition, or you can use a lot of it, right, to dissolve the ego and to actually grow closer to God and experience God in a completely different way when your ego is dissolved. And I think that many people use this stuff irresponsibly or they, they, they don't understand or go in with the right kind of intention. But I think that, that everything that is on this planet can be a blessing or a curse depending on how you use it. And so I, I have no issues, you know, as a Christian with, with saying that everything on this planet is a blessing. It just depends on how you use it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Why do you think it hasn't traditionally been a part of that tradition? Do you think of the, right. because of the fears of abuse and of people not using things? I Did Moses know, I, really see know, a burning bush? Or I, don't, smoke I don't know that it hasn't been. I don't know that it hasn't been, you know, and, and I haven't delved too deeply into the history, but I think that there is there there is evidence of plant medicine usage amongst a lot of historical Christian sects. Mm. Um, I think that at the same time, there is kind of, especially in America, the puritanical version of Christianity that dictates that you 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 never want to you know whatever lose control of your senses and dissolve your ego and you know we're just hard working you know blue mm -hmm. collar you know go to church every sunday sing your songs but i mean these are the uh, in many cases i'm probably going to offend some people these are the same type of people eating twinkies and doritos at the church potluck and letting mm -hmm. their bodies go to go to crap and you know and not not really delving deeply in, into caring for themselves or developing you know a relationship with the bodies that they've been given with the temples that they've been given so I, 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 
I think a big part of it is just kind of like this this puritanical form of Christianity that has developed, especially in America, that's held mm-hmm. a lot of Christians back from that. And also because, well, let's face it, like there is a deep history of like shamanism and satanic worship and demonic activity and all that stuff that's associated with any of these things. Because once you enter into the spirit world, there's a lot of that, right? But there's not just demons, right? There's also angels. There's not just Satan. There's also God, Right, so there's two elements of the spirit world, mm. right? There's light and dark. There's the good force and there's the bad force or whatever it is in Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Justin got excited <laughs> yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let's change gears Stay a little away bit. from the dark. Uh, let, yeah, let's change gears a little bit. You um, recently, you look like you put on, I don't know how many pounds of muscle. What'd you do? You change your training? Was it Adam's challenge? It was Adam's swimming challenge. <laughs> <laughs> nah. You look like I, you had uh, put on like 15 pounds of muscle. Yeah. 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 I, a, a big part of it was, you know, I interviewed Dr. Paul Saladino. And as with anything, I like to try out a lot of the stuff that I talk mm-hmm. about on podcasts. So I adopted a largely nose to tail carnivore based diet. Um, and that I, put the muscle I, on you? I threw in some other things too. I was doing like colostrum. I was doing uh, like a lot of kefir, a ton of liver, organ meats. Um, just eating a lot more food in general. I was going to say, you you Doing, bumped your calories significantly. Yeah, I remember yeah. you saying. No, I was eating about 5,000, 6,000 calories yeah. a day from a lot of protein sources, taking a lot of digestive enzymes. Dude, 5,000 calories on a yeah. carnivore diet? Which is, is what I used to do when I was bodybuilding too. <sighs> yeah, That's but, but I tried dude, to man. do that. I had yeah, a really hard real time tough. doing that. I also had tubers. Tubers, raw honey, and berries. A uh, okay. ton of bone broth. A lot of collagen. Uh, I also made dessert, which was like a collagen ice cream. And I made that. And this was not carnivore, but I just made this to get my calories in at night. Uh, okay. So mm-hmm. coconut milk with collagen, with stevia, with nut butter, almost like one of those fat bombs yeah, that has yeah. a lot of collagen in it that you have mm-hmm. at night. So eating a lot of food. Uh, I was lifting a lot more. Uh, doing like four days a week, full body lifting, a lot less endurance and um, put on a decent amount of muscle. And then I went to that damn like Swiss clinic healing retreat thing over the summer where it was like colonics and enemas every day. And like, oh my fast. God. Dude, they come up for breakfast fun. after you've had like all the poo and everything else just like sucked out of your insides and you're starved and you want to like, yeah, like and chew up salad. an arm, <laughs> not even a salad, like a smoothie, but like their definition of a smoothie is like the six ounce glass cup with like the spinach floating in it. Like, <laughs> oh, not like my idea of a smoothie is it's like, it's like 40 grams of whey protein <laughs> with some <laughs> collagen and coconut milk peanut and butter bone <laughs> broth and peanut butter and yeah, and in a, like a giant big gulp, you know, 36 ounce or, but no, these tiny little smoothies. So I lost and there was no gym there and I was doing some BFR band training just to kind of try to keep a little bit of muscle on. Uh, so I lost it. So now I'm trying to put muscle back on and I'm not doing like a strict carnivore diet anymore, but it, it was mostly just lifting more and eating a lot more. Now, now, how do you feel when you're bigger versus when you're smaller? Which one do you like more? What are the, what are the differences for you? I kind of like to be bigger. Do you? Yeah. How come? Yeah. I just like the feels way it good. makes me feel. Feels like good to fill out your shirts. Good. My my libido is higher. Sure. Um. I like honestly. I like to lift and I like to eat. Right. And so that's it's it's fun when you can just eat and turn into muscle. And um. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm vain, but I just I I like to to keep some some meat on my bones. You know, I think from a longevity standpoint, the more meat you have on your bones, you know, healthy, functional muscle going into your later years of life, you know, we know that there are correlations between things like grip strength and and, uh, deadlift weight and longevity. So I I think part of it is just, you know, being more resilient overall. Are you measuring your hormones when you're doing this to see if there's any changes in testosterone and and all that? Yeah. And and there is an increase in testosterone, increase in free testosterone. Uh, You know, and this concerns a lot of people. Also an increase in IGF-1, an increase in insulin, an increase in hemoglobin A1C and some of those parameters that you could argue are deleterious for longevity. But I, I didn't see a steep rise in those, but a slight bump in some of these parameters that suggest enhanced mTOR activation, mm-hmm. um, enhanced uh, substrate availability. Well, but- context matters, doesn't it? Because I think in the context of an inflammatory pro-cancer state, probably bad. But in the context of a healthy body, those are just anabolic uh, compounds. They're just making you build muscle. I think a big part of it, and, and uh, I was talking with Dr. Uh, Mercola about this, you know, the, the whole concept of autophagy paired with mTOR. 
And I think that you can kind of sort of have the best of both worlds. And I was trying to do this as much as possible and still am when eating a large number of calories, 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast, and then taking agents that mimic autophagy or induce autophagy at night. So while you're at sleep, you're getting a little bit less mTOR activation and a little bit, a little bit more autophagy. So what, are, what there, were you taking? Uh, Carcetin, chamomile, Garcinia, Powdy Arco and glycine mm. all you can buy them in like organic, you know, raw powdered bags on sure. Amazon and you can just stir that into hot water before you go to bed at night. And all of those will induce autophagy. Really? So it's almost like your press pulse cycling, right? So you wake up, you know, you, you, you're in your 12 to 16 hour fast, you've engaged in autophagy, and then you have that compressed feeding window during the day, you know, so I'll eat until about 8 PM, get a lot of food in the system, stay very anabolic, have a lifting session in that window or an exercise session in that window. And then you go back into autophagy in the evening. And so the amino acid glycine, that's strange. Yeah. So that, that yeah. induces autophagy. How, yeah. how, how is that? I think probably because it, uh, it it balances out the high amounts of methionine that you're getting from a lot of the protein sources, particularly oh, meat. So more than, so day. really what it's doing is kind of nullifying the, the mTOR, right. if anything. That, that's one of the, the common complaints made against something like a carnivore diet that's based on just like ribeye steaks is that you're not getting enough glycine unless you're eating nose to tail and getting some organ meats and some bone broth and things like that. So just adding in a little bit more glycine in the evening. Uh, any changes in inflammatory well. markers? Because some people say, oh, there's tons more inflammation when you're eating a lot of meat. No, no. Wow. I actually had less inflammation and I think it was probably because I was consuming a lot less well, it's a very basic diet really when you look at it. Tubers, berries, honey, bone broth, nose to tail organ meat, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot fewer of those plant defense compounds. There's there's a lot fewer things, you know, like soy or legumes or things that, that may induce an inflammatory response, even dairy, for example. So I I didn't see an increase in inflammation. We just watched uh, the documentary, the one produced by Arnold Game Schwarzenegger. Changers. Yeah, yeah, Game Changers. I, I want to hear your guys' opinion on this because I walked in here and I, I, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm not too plugged into what's going on in the documentary scene, but you told me, you already asked me if I watch this new documentary. So what's going on with Arnold? Well, he, he co-produced this documentary, um, and it's really pushing this plant-based or, and they don't even use the word vegan or vegetarian too much. They say plant-based quite a bit, um, but they're, they're pushing this agenda of getting people off meat. And the entire documentary did a damn good job and they, they produced it very, very well at demonizing the consumption of, of animal uh, products. Um, and they demonized all of it, including high quality grass fed meats, uh, organ meats. Um, and, and it was very, and I mean, uh, I, in my opinion, it was very misleading. They used lots of studies that were very misleading. For example, they talked about B12 and how you can't get B12 from, from vegetable sources, but you can't really get them great from animals either, they said. And so therefore, everybody should take B12. So that's how they, exactly. <laughs> that's how they made that, that, that case right there. Or they used a, 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 you know, a comparison that I thought was silly where they said, they talked about antioxidants and said, a head of lettuce has way more antioxidants than a piece of salmon, which is a silly comparison because a head of, a salmon has lots of omega-3 fatty acids and proteins yeah. and other nutrients. Not to mention lettuce is a bioremediant. It's yeah. nature's filter. Yeah, so. <laughs> In a different way, people say liver yeah. is nature's filter. Yeah. But in the liver, phase one and phase two uh, uh, pathways just excrete all the toxins into the urine and the stool and the sweat. Lettuce keeps it. Lettuce just keeps it in there. So when you eat lettuce, unless you know the exact place that lettuce was grown and the farmer you got it from, you're essentially eating a filter that filtered Same out. Same is you know, true for other toxins, uh, herbicides. They did a lot. They did a lot of sleight of hand moves. Where they they present some information that was true, but then they would go left and like, and this is why doing this is bad. You know, it was like, well, yeah. wait a second, those aren't even connected. Yeah, so so it was a lot of that, and, and it feels like there's a, especially recently, there's this really strong vegan push, and for the first time, uh, as as far as I can recall, a diet has been politicized because now it's being connected to the environment and how not eating meat is also better for the environment. And it's your duty and it's a good thing to do. The thing that worries me is this, Ben. In, in my experience as a trainer, I'd love your opinion on this. In my experience as a trainer, uh, training hundreds or maybe thousands of people by proxy because I had trainers that worked for me who trained other clients. 
that I was always, I'm always blown away by the individual variants that you see with people. I mean, metabolisms are very complex. Your microbiome is like a fingerprint. Then you have, if you throw in your psychology and your experiences with food and all that stuff, to say that one diet is better for everybody, I don't care what the diet is. That's terrible advice yeah. because I've trained clients who genuinely were healthier on a largely vegan diet. And I've also trained clients who ate a lot of meat, mostly meat, and who also had improvements in health. So for me, that's the big problem. The big problem is that there's a, a huge individual variance there that nobody's taking account for. And this goes for all diets that, that talk about being the best diet ever. The second part is this, and I'd also like your opinion on this, is that uh, when you eat mostly vegetables or vegan diets, now luckily we, have moder- we live in modern times where I could go to Whole Foods and I have access to an incredibly wide variety of uh, plants-based foods that normally I would never have uh, access to. You got stuff from South America. crackers, coated in chocolate, everything. And that kind of stuff. (laughs) Just like nature. But I have have like (laughs) food from South America, food from stuff that's growing, you know, all the time. You would never have that in nature. But it takes a lot of planning and nutrient deficiencies. Studies show this. This is not my opinion. This is real documented studies show that, that vegans tend to suffer from more nutrient deficiencies because they require they just require more planning. And so if we're going to talk all these people out of eating meat, what they'll end up doing is taking the one unprocessed food out of their diet, which is a steak, and replace it with processed something that's not... Uh, that, Impossible you know, burger. Yeah, or some crap like that. So I'd like your opinion on that kind of stuff. And we'll start with the individual variants. What's your opinion on that? My opinion on the individual variants is that we could say the same thing about a ketogenic diet. Absolutely. Right? There, there are many people with familial hypercholesteremia or with what's called PPAR gene issues uh, or even gallbladder and liver, like, like actual anatomical issues, who respond very poorly to a high fat diet, particularly a diet that's high in saturated fats versus the monounsaturates and smaller amounts of the polyunsaturates. So you can create an inflammatory firestorm in people who are not not genetically adapted to a ketogenic diet and who in that scenario, such as familial hypercholesteremia, would respond much better to a diet rich in plant fibers, some amounts of, of coconut, large amounts of fish, and you know many many Mediterranean fats, or what would even be referred to as, if people want to look this up, a Catavan Islander diet, where uh, many of the inhabitants of that island carry the gene for familial hypercholesteremia, and no cardiovascular disease manifests because their diet is structured mm-hmm. in such a way that that cholesterol does not become atherosclerotic. Sclerotic. You know, I'll pause there for a second because, it, and it makes perfect sense that people who evolve there would develop a genetic uh, capability to produce tremendous amounts of cholesterol because their diets included very little saturated fats and very little uh, dietary cholesterol. And cholesterol is essential for the body. It's why your body makes it. So it makes sense for them that their bodies will produce a tremendous amount of cholesterol in that environment. That's what keeps them alive. You move them to a ketogenic diet, and now it's you know too much. It's you know five times five. It's twenty five now, and they've got things multiplying. And I've seen people who've gone ketogenic and have cholesterol levels get hit like four hundred who have hypercholesteremia. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. Or you move them out of their environment, mm-hmm. and and in many cases the diet that they've developed in the environment that they live in is a diet that they've developed because they have discovered over thousands of years that that's what helps to protect them against either their built-in genetic propensity to a certain disease or the environment's impact on their propensity for certain conditions. Mm. So what I mean by that is you look at the Icelandic population who actually should have a very high rate of seasonal affective disorder and depression, and they do not because primarily of the rich amount of omega-3 fatty acids and DHA that are found in the traditional Icelandic diet, reindeer and and fish, for example. And you uproot that person and you take them out of that dietary context and into the same dark scenario in, let's say, Seattle, Washington, and you see the Icelandic population there actually manifesting seasonal affective disorder and depression. Or you look at Cameroon, Africa, where they have a gene that would normally predispose them to high rates of colon cancer, but that is an extremely fiber-rich diet that they consume over there. And you take that same population and you put them in, say, like Southeast United States, and you have many people of African descent dying of colon cancer 
cancer in Southeast United States because they no longer have adopted the diet that would have protected them in their ancestral context from that disease manifesting. A final example would be Mexico, right? The Tamamahara Indian tribe. They carry many of the genes that would predispose them to higher rates of diabetes. But the way that they cook and prepare their legumes and their corn and their squash those are those are lower glycemic index foods than say like the the refried beans and the flour tortillas and the chips and the soda and the the sweet drinks that they'd be consuming in say like a Tex-Mex diet or or a Southern California scenario and you see diabetes manifest in that population once they're in that scenario. So a big part of this when we're looking at should I eat a plant-based diet, should I eat a meat-based diet, should I eat a mix thereof is what did my ancestors eat and what am I genetically predisposed to thrive on, right? That's one big part of it. And then another part of it is actually doing Was it adherence. Cust- yeah, cu- <laughs> customization of the diet. I mean, everybody, everybody I coach, they get they get a Cyrex food allergy panel. And we take a deep dive into their true immunoglobulin reaction to a variety of different foods to ensure that they're not eating things that they're not predisposed to be able to handle, that they have a true allergic reaction towards. Everybody gets a NutriVal panel, which is a micronutrient analysis, fatty acids, amino acids, mm-hmm. all down the range so that we can identify any holes that need to be filled in via supplementation. Because some people need to take vitamin D and for others, they're getting, you know, they're, they're getting vitamin D toxicity and calcification of the arteries from taking vitamin D because their levels are topped off just fine. Everybody gets a gut test for yeast, fungus, parasites, so that we know what they need to be taking or what they don't need to be taking to address their gut. So we can use a blend of ancestral wisdom by looking at what your ancestors ate and what you're genetically predisposed to do well on combined with modern science and blood testing, urine testing, and stool testing to determine whether you need to fill in gaps with supplementation, what kind of diet you might be best predisposed towards from from a food allergy, a food elimination standpoint. And then you can figure out the exact diet that's right for you, and that's and that's my big, uh, that's one of my big problems is we if we make this blanket, this is the diet that's best for everybody, and demonize, not just say this is a good diet, but also demonize an entire category of food that humans have eaten forever, we could be setting up a lot of people for some bad health and some bad times, and then on the environmental sense, nothing's worse for the environment than unhealthy humans. Mm-hmm. Unhealthy humans are terrible from the environment. Everything from the medicine that needs to be pre-produced to their unproductivity to their their attitudes about life, that will poison the earth faster than almost anything I can think of. Um, and this is the conversation that I you know that I've been having around this. There's also one other uh, part of this, Ben, which is the the psychological component uh, of food. You know, you talked about the genetics, their blood. Uh, you talked about their microbiome. These are all physiological aspects of of a human and how they may react and respond to food. But we completely negate and, and we don't even talk about the psychological piece that there is to food, which in my experience as a trainer, I've, I've trained mostly everyday regular people. And the part that I had to focus on and talk about and speak to most was the psychological component. And you know what? Sometimes foods may not necessarily work for you great physiologically, but psychologically, they, they, this is something that you enjoy and there's a, there, that is a part of health. Um, you know, studies show that, for example, people who have lots of bad relationships in their lives, that's as, be, that's as big of a risk factor for poor health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Yep. So if I, you know, if my mom makes homemade pasta and I haven't seen my mom for a while and I get this wonderful feeling when I eat that pasta with my family, but maybe my genes show that I probably shouldn't eat a lot of carbs because physiologically, but so what? Sometimes it may be, you know, you're, you're doing a little balancing thing. And when we're making these broad general statements and, you know, this, this huge push for eating a particular way, some people are going to do great. A lot of people are not going to do so great. Yeah. I've, I've got two thoughts about that. First, there is a dangerous slippery slope when you get down to the psychological aspects of food because you, you get into the scenario that I see a lot of people getting into, especially parents who grew up, and, and I grew up on all this too, comfort foods. Right? Oh, yeah. Rich, creamy craft macaroni and cheese <laughs> and Pop-Tarts and uh, a peanut butter Captain Crunch. 
uh, hot pockets, take and bake pizza. Um, I feel like I should be smoking uh, weed yeah, right what's now. What's happening? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Vel- Velveeta cheese, chicken biscuit Why crackers. Right, and the parents say, "Justin just orgasm." Oh, yeah. Kid, you're growing up in America. You got you got to have some of the foods that I grew sure, up on, sure. right? Bagel so, bites. so there can be a slippery slope, and and that's actually where I think there's a great business opportunity for a lot of, of of companies in the health and fitness sector to develop. You know, similar to what Mark Sisson did with mayonnaise, mm-hmm. healthy versions of a lot of these comfort foods, right? And then could you make a craft macaroni and cheese and use like a turmeric to get that nice yellow color, and maybe use like a like a rice or a quinoa pasta that you've engineered to get that same mouthfeel, but you have the same shape of the noodles and a similar kind of box size that it comes in. And so I, I think that we can overcome that issue by simply creating healthy versions of a lot of these comfort foods that, that many of us still crave. Uh, the, the, the second part of this, I've completely forgotten. Uh, <laughs> I totally derailed myself. Um, the, the, yeah, now I remember what I was going to say. The second part of this is, uh, and this is an issue that I have with the carnivore diet and experience with the carnivore diet, right? When you look at the carnivore diet, one of the proponents of it, a uh, vocal proponent of late is Dr. Paul Saladino. Bless his heart. Super smart guy, very passionate about the diet, very well educated, and uh, eats this nose to tail, you know, organ consumption, you know, and if he's going to have a steak, it's just like, you know, blanched with some salt on it and everything's, you know, brown and red and a little bit whitish, you know, on the table in front of him. And, you know, I've invited him out to dinner and he'll show up with his little, you know, Ziploc bag with a sheep testicle and some kidney suet and, and tallow, right? Mm. And mm. When, when I try to, to do this at home and my wife you know bakes the lovely slow fermented sourdough cinnamon rolls on a saturday morning that you know with like a like an organic raw dairy cream cheese frosting you know with coconut sugar and takes out the heirloom tomatoes with some basil and some fresh mozzarella drizzled in olive oil and she makes her her wonderful you know kale and bok choy and swiss chard salad from fresh from the garden and dressed with this lovely citrus vinaigrette and i sit down at the table and all i've got in front of me is a ribeye and a sheep like, testicle like <laughs> sure, like like sure I like, do agree hmm. with Paul that a lot of these plant foods are poor people's food, right? They're survival foods that we turn to when we couldn't get access to meat and realize that, you know, we, we got to figure out how to eat plants for survival and deactivate these natural built-in plant defense mechanisms and, you know, and, and make a, a, a salad out in the wilderness. But over thousands of years, these same plant foods have progressed to be beautiful, lovely, vibrant parts of tradition and culture, you know, marinara with spaghetti mm. and, and cinnamon rolls. And, you know, in Japan, you know, fermented natto with, with rice and seaweed. And for us to simply shove all that aside and say, we're going to myopically eat just one food because all we're worried about is health. Really, that's another part of the psychological aspects is, you know, we, we need to consider some of these myopic diets that eliminate a great deal of foods. They're stripping us of some of the enjoyment of simply being able to gather around a Thanksgiving table and have, you know, 12 different items there and we can eat them all because it's just part of tradition and happiness. <laughs> totally. A hundred percent agree with you. What's uh, what's Paul's angle? What is uh, We haven't had him on the show. I know they've, they, his team has reached out to us multiple times and we've just, I, we got, once we did the whole keto talk enough time and carnivore talk enough time I was kind of like over the right because we have the vitamin C deficiency like how did he explain that Uh, you mean the lack of vitamin C that you'd have on a carnivore diet I think that he showed data that you can get bioavailable vitamin C from meat Mm, from organ meat properly yeah yeah and and a well structured nose to tail carnivore diet does indeed give you just about everything that you need except electrolytes which is why he throws in salt Mm. and he's very smart and he's very well researched and he makes a wonderful case that I agree with that a well structured nose to tail carnivore diet can indeed give you everything that you need to sustain life while not presenting your gut with a lot of the built in natural plant defense mechanisms that can screw some people over but it's it can be a pretty damn restrictive and boring diet and i think it's just an elimination diet that someone could follow for a certain period of time that's how i but, look at it but it's not it, it's not for life you know the dude's a bachelor right he doesn't have a family, <laughs> he's a, yeah. for a reason and, yeah yeah and, and so it's I a think hard sell it'd be very easy to do if you're just living on your own and you know eating eating whatever you want to eat but when i gather around the table like at the greenfield house this kind of returns back to structuring your environment like 
when dinner rolls around and we, we kind of eat late because so everything's out of the way right by the time we get to dinner and we're dragging out table topics or boggle or quiddler or balderdash or chess or you know exploding kittens or uh, unstable unicorns you know any of these card games and we sit around the table for like an hour and a half and we laugh and we play and we eat all these foods and we drink wine and then we go upstairs and we play some guitar or ukulele or piano and the boys fall asleep reading and mom and I go in and we integrate and face each other and chat and that's how we end our day and and you know I just can't do that in front of a sheep testicle mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I got a, I got a question for you Ben um, there's a there's a heavy heavy science side to you but there's also a heavy spiritual side to you and and I'm looking at current research when it comes to longevity I've read some articles saying how aging is a disease that can be cured at some point. Um, scientifically speaking, sounds great. Let's solve this problem. We don't have to age. We won't have any of the problems with that. The spiritual side of me, though, thinks that might not be such a good idea because I think there's a lot we can learn from realizing our own mortality. Where do you stand on that? I'm trying to live as long as I can with the exception that I don't want to live as long as I can cold and libido less and hungry and weak because all I'm doing is maximizing autophagy, you know, and fasting and taking a cold bath every day. But the reason that I'm trying to live a long time with good quality of life and good energy is because I believe that every single one of us was put upon this planet with a unique purpose in life, a unique change that we can affect in the world. And the longer that we're around, the greater impact that we're able to make and the greater we're able to achieve that purpose. The more we take care of our bodies and try to keep ourselves here as long as we can, learning and building upon the learning that we've done, the more use that we can be to the world and the greater impact that we're going to make. I mean, when I look at, you know, guys like Graham Hancock and, and their philosophy or their theories that we at one point as society were incredibly evolved, that maybe there was some great disaster, like a flood that struck at one time. But prior to that, we had freaking like computers and, you know, we, we weren't walking around like togas and, and bathrobes, like humankind, you know, even before we built the pyramids and everything else that seemed to have taken a great deal of engineering, it's possible that we were very, very well advanced, you know, having had the ability to advance for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and some would say even millions of years before some great disaster struck, and we had to kind of start out again at ground zero. But there's also a lot of evidence that humans lived for a pretty long period of time, too. And I mean, it keeps popping yeah, up, right? Yeah, they keep finding yeah, archaeological finds yeah, that uh, yeah. predates all the history. Yeah, biblically, you know, they've got like Methuselah is 969 years old, or let's even say 800 years old. Guys, think about this. Like, if you were, were ancient man or woman, and you're like 50, hopefully you've figured out how to make a fire by that time. <laughs> and then you have 750 freaking more years to make this world a better place. And to fit, maybe by, by age 100, you figure out how to make a wheel, right? And I would imagine by about 150, 175, you're thinking a little bit about electricity. And maybe by the time you're 200, you're thinking about, you know, how to get something else to, to do some thinking for you, like a computer chip or binary coding. By the time you're 500, you probably would invent a lot of cool shit, right? <laughs> and so I think about it that way to a certain extent too. I'm like, geez, if I've learned a shit ton about health and fitness and nutrition and spirituality and happiness and longevity, by the time I'm 90, and I've somehow built my life, so I've still got 40 more years at that point. Think about all the other cool shit I could do to help people. Sure, right? sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the living forever part is the part that I'm like, yeah. ah, I don't know about yeah, that. It's almost like yeah. exponential wisdom that can build over time if you keep yourself around for a while. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> now, you've, you've had people on your show that talk a lot about like longevity and living a long time. Like, What have you learned from them that's like significant? A lot. That, you know, that, that, that is a huge topic and there, there's a, we, we could, we could talk for hours about longevity and anti-aging, but I would say some of the more exciting fields right now in the anti-aging front, because, you know, you, people are talking about, you know, optimize your relationships, caloric restriction, you know, 
minimize glycemic variability, minimize inflammation, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, low level physical activity every day, get out in nature, you know, a lot of the blue zones concepts, but when we dig into the more exciting science, some of the things that I think are the real frontier of anti-aging medicine, uh, one would be the use of NAD. We know that NAD levels dramatically decline with age, and by keeping those levels elevated, we can really increase mitochondrial health in a very dramatic way, even with age. So the use of NAD IVs, NAD patches, uh, which I use very frequently, uh, or even NAD or similarly, uh, two other molecules that are similar to NAD, NR, which is nicotinamide riboside, and NMN, which is uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide. These can be used as oral supplementation to keep NAD levels elevated. NAD is one big one. Is NAD, right? are is, NAD patches, are those commercially available or do you have to get them? They, you can, you can purchase them. I buy them from the NAD clinic in San Diego. Okay. Yeah. And I wear one. These are, these week. are to help you get off cigarettes too. Is that right? They can be used. Yep. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wow. very I was common, just bullshitting. <laughs> very common treatment for addiction and opioid therapy. No but shit. Exactly. Higher dose NAD IVs, especially that's what that clinic specializes in actually. And they successfully treat a lot of patients. No kidding. So NAD, that's one. Peptides are another. Uh, there's a lot of Russian research and even Russian human research on decrease of all-cause mortality with two 10-day cycles of a peptide called epitalon. And hmm. they've gotten similar results with a peptide called MOTC. There's another one that staves off all the immune system degradation that can occur with age called thymosin alpha-1. And there are companies like uh, Taylor Made Compounding in Kentucky who have these amino acid sequencers, and they can precisely target any type of cellular activity such as mitochondrial proliferation or production of killer T cells or anything like that with peptides, which are usually administered uh, subcutaneously with an insulin syringe, but you know, some are topical. Um, I'm wearing one right now. It's a GHK CU copper peptide transdermal delivery, a little band-aid right there on my mm. abs, and that increases stem cell mobilization. So it increases the movement of stem, cell, stem cells from my bone marrow into my bloodstreams. So they can be mobilized for better recovery, you know, healing of injuries, et cetera. So peptides are, are a really, really cool field mm. right now in anti-aging. Uh, probably one of the last ones that I think is uh, – is based off of research being conducted right now by Dr. David Sinclair, and he has a new book called Lifespan about this, uh, the use of a virus that you'd actually be given at an early age that would activate your immune system, but the virus is actually deactivated. They figure out how to deliver it in a manner to where it stays in your system completely deactivated, and then when you're at a later age, like 45 or 50, you can activate the virus, and it will do things, and they've studied this in rodent models so far, like get rid of gray hair, decrease wrinkles, reverse what? aging, and they measure this thing called the aging clock, which is actually not like telomere length, but it's the, the RNA and what's called the nucleoli of the cell. And they've shown that with this type of treatment, you can almost like reverse aging with, with they call it cellular reprogramming. Mm. Or so turn into a zombie. Yeah. I feel like every zombie yeah. movie starts <laughs> off like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. But they're, they're studying Man, that, that in, is out in, there. Uh, in rodent models right now. And they've achieved something similar. A new study came out two weeks ago and all they did was stack, you know, and they're, they're using a lot of off-label pharmaceuticals now for anti-aging. But in this particular study, they showed a, a two and a half year reversal of aging by measuring a lot of these DNA markers of aging. Uh, with the use of metformin, which is a you know it's mm -hmm. off-label drug that's commonly used for diabetes. I, I don't like it. I think there's better alternatives. Uh, DHEA and growth hormone, mm -hmm. and so they used those three and saw profound results from mm -hmm. an anti-aging standpoint. Now, how, all of all these things that you're listing off, how many of them actually have a, a, carry a lot of weight in comparison to things that we know like good relationships, lowering stress? strength exercise, you know, the big rocks, like how, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, if you're missing, if you're sleeping two, three hours a night, you have a high stress job and then you're, you're using all these, these things, yeah, there, is it worth anything really? There, therein lies the rub and I'm going to have him on my podcast cause I want to throw this question at him, but like David Sinclair, that researcher that I mentioned, right? He's on metformin and statins 
and he's not exercising and he's traveling mm. all over the globe and I don't mm. think he's sleeping that well. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth or, or, or paint him in a poor light, but I think that, you know, many of these anti-aging researchers or, or biohackers or whatever, they don't have the basic foundational principles dialed yeah, in. It's the way I, de- it's the way I defend you always and because the, everybody yeah. that, that harks on, on biohacking people, and if they try and lump you in that category, I'm like, you know, Ben really is somebody who I personally can say uh, does all the big things first. You know what I'm saying? It's not like you're doing must, all these. Yeah. You must have the foundation. And uh, a, a reporter asked me this question last week. He said, so what What are the best biohacks? Where do I start? And I said, I don't know you. I, I don't know if you need to increase your deep sleep versus your REM sleep. I don't know if for you it's hormonal optimization or if the hormones are just fine and we need to address you know, white blood cell count. I don't know if uh, you, you've got rampant inflammation or if inflammation is just fine and we instead need to focus on physical activity. But I did tell him that other than what we already know that you've alluded to from the Blue Zones, Adam, like relationships and not smoking and you know properly structured diet and some elements of fasting, et cetera, I always start with the foundation of mitochondria. I think, I think mitochondria are, are the most important thing to take care of if you want to be healthy or live a long time. And there are six things that I address with everybody I work with. Everybody I work with, there's six variables for mitochondria. Number one is earthing or grounding, right? actually getting in touch with the planet, walking outside barefoot, camping, swimming in the ocean, jumping in the sea, walking on the beach, getting exposed to all these negative ions that the planet emits because when we're up on jets, when we're getting bombarded by Wi-Fi, EMF, et cetera, the electrochemical gradient across a cell drops to about negative 20 millivolts. And it should be closer to about negative 60 or so. And getting absorbed or, or getting negative ions absorbed by the planet. There's a whole book about this called Earthing by Clint Ober that goes into the profound impact just being in touch with our planet has on our body, not to mention the beneficial effects of nature in general. That's one. Number two is light. UVA, UVB, infrared, near-infrared, and red light, preferably from sunlight, being out in the sun every single day. And if you can't get out in the sun, you buy these fancy biohacking red light panels or, or red light producing devices, and you simulate that. But ideally, I, I you get out in the sun. Sorry to interrupt you right yeah. there, but to that point, I predict that to be a huge market in the future just because we're – we seem to be more indoors today than we ever were before and on yep. computers. And it's this getting form. worse. Yeah. yeah. Do you think so too? Do you think red light's going to continue just to explode? Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think not only red light, but full spectrum light, right? Light that will produce UVA, UVB, near, red, far, like lights that get as close to simulating what the sun does as yeah. possible. Uh, number three would be, uh, number three and four would be heat and cold. Mm. Right, like actual mild amounts of hormesis, which also stimulate mitochondria. So, like a regular sauna practice and a regular cold practice, and exercising and getting hot counts as heat as well. But you know, we know from Finland that that a regular sauna practice has massive impact on longevity, and we know that jumping in a cold bath, cold lake, taking cold showers, we know that that's also very mm-hmm. helpful for mitochondria. Mm-hmm. And then the last two, if we're thinking of the human body as a battery and we're thinking about this millivolt potential, which heat, cold, earthing, grounding, and light all affect uh, water and minerals, right? Like good, clean water. And there's a lot going on in the water sector right now, like hydrogen water and deuterium depleted water and structured water. And if you find all that confusing, just start with pure, you know, filtered spring water as close as you can get to nature and minerals. Right, like putting a pitch of sea salt, taking some electrolytes, you know, using, you know, any, any of these these type of full spectrum minerals that you can get. But I start with those six bases, right? Earthing, grounding, light, heat, cold, water, and minerals. And, you know, screw like the fancy peptides and stem cells and injectable viruses. Like if you start with that stuff and then you throw in what you were talking about, all the blue zones practices, you've got a really solid foundation. Yeah. Of all the things that you've, because you've tried so many different things, you've experimented on yourself quite a bit. You ever have it, something go wrong? Where you you try something out, and you're like, oh, this this fucked me up a little I bit. I don't know why the fuck I always get asked that question. Like people <laughs> people always want to know. It's fun, and, Ben. We want to know. I always get disappointed because I, I don't. Really well, that's have because anything. I feel like you. Yeah. He's just such a nerd. He does all the research. What about well, when you went to go forge like, plants and then you had a negative reaction? I, I remember your wife told me that story. Yeah, but that's not biohacking. That's like right. that's like messing up shit when you're cooking. You yeah, know? That's, like, <laughs> yeah that, that's another thing that gets me. Right? Like putting butter in your tea or coffee or whatever. That's not 
biohacking. I feel like you're cooking, very. I feel like you, know, you approach like, most things pretty skeptical and do a lot yeah. of research before you decide to shove it in your own dick. I mean, I don't think you're the yeah. type of person that yeah. would do something like that. I would until, hope so. Until you already have. Yeah, I mean, there's there's times when I thought maybe you know uh, something was gonna happen. Like when I got the stem cells injected in my dick, like it turned black and blue for a couple of days, and I wondered if I actually had like you know what's it broke called? It. tissue necrosis. <laughs> oh man, oh. Oh. Uh, I got word for you, Adam. It's not a bone. You can't break it. I don't know if anybody told you that, but. Uh, I wondered if I got like tissue story. necrosis. Oh, if it doesn't but, work, bro, it's broken. Yeah, I don't give yeah, a fuck how you yeah, how you okay. fucking word it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I thought that that might might do something, but it was it was fine. And um, no, like I don't have any sexy thing that's happened to me. Like I, honestly, uh. no, I've done stupider stupider shit and messed myself up more. Like you know, training for Ironman or sure, you know, or doing this the death race or whatever than yeah. I have you know with 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 uh biohacking are you running uh, tahoe this year are you going out tahoe yeah you are yeah, i'll be racing tahoe. you're gonna race yeah okay yeah i'm still training pretty hard and then uh i'm thinking about hanging up the hat after that and just, oh are you yeah just kind of you think you're gonna move away from a lot of the endurance know. stuff i think big time yeah yeah mm. what are you gonna move more towards what just losing the fire in my belly really just playing mixed doubles tennis with my wife and you know i'll start Strength training. Start, start doing a little bit more jujitsu rolling with my kids and oh, filling, okay. filling out those medium I mean, shirts you know what like <laughs> i i love i love to crush it at the gym like i just love i love to go out and work out hard and i'm to the point now where i i cannot be signed up for any race or any competition and I just still crave just going out and crushing it. Hell like, yeah. Like something, I just feel great when I'm doing that. So I don't really need, you know, I used to think I needed that motivation of being signed up for a race or whatever, bodybuilding competition or, or some type of event. But I've realized as I've grown older, like I'm just wired to move. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, uh, Absolutely. And, and as long as I'm moving, I'm happy. I don't have to be you know, towing the starting line of a race. Excellent. Well, it's always a good time with you, Ben. Yeah. Dude, yeah, you guys man. too. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Too. Good to see best. you again. Yep. I love you guys. Thank love you. Same here. Brother.